news for you. Um, I got free t-shirts. Well, I think you'd be way more excited than that. <laughs> Come on, free stuff. All right. But yeah, right I never get that free stuff. Um, and uh, Microsoft was was talking about you know with the new Azure DevOps and if anybody wanted to do a DevOps event and I said, well, what constitutes as a DevOps event, an Azure DevOps event? Like, does it have to be can it just be a talk at the user group? And they said, yeah. And if you do one, we'll give you a box of T-shirts. So I actually did one at my own user group in Toronto, and I ordered a box of T-shirts, and they never came because they screwed up the delivery. So you guys got them. How's that? Want to see? So I'll. Uh, Sometime, maybe at break, you guys can come up and or at the end. And I've got, I've only got five. Like I think I've got five XLs, five large, five medium, five small, and I think there's three ladies, large, medium, small. So some of you might be getting one for your wife or child. But we're is that the Canada Post strike benefit? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it might be yeah, benefit for you guys. Um, yeah, no, they just kept saying that it wasn't. They, they, there was a problem with shipping. And I could say, well, the, the, the group is in three days. I kept emailing someone, and they, you know, sorry, it's not going to come. So I was going to order another box for this event anyway, but it turns out I didn't have to. So you can there. Um, okay, so let's. Uh, so I've been here before. I see some familiar faces. Um, I talked about Team Foundation Server and VSDS and all the other things that it was named. Um, uh, now it's called Azure DevOps, and I'm, I am going to take this on a bit of a tour. I'm going to do uh, a bit of a demo, probably not as in depth of a, as I've done in the past. I think I've done sessions that are strictly on build and release and I, you know, different things like that. But we're going to kind of do a, a more high level tour and talk a bit about why it's called Azure DevOps and what they're doing with it. Um, so let's do that. Let's, uh, let's start by um, <clears throat> talking about the new Microsoft. We were talking about this just before everybody came in. Um, you know, I remember I've been writing software for probably 30 Take you know, 30 over 30 years, 32 years, 33 years, and you know, back in Microsoft was not anything. You know, they were a C compiler to me. That's what they were, um, and they weren't the best C compiler. They were a C compiler, uh, and it was okay. But everybody hated IBM, right? You all hated it. We all hated IBM because they were the big guys and they had all the money and they controlled everything and they made you do stuff. And then you know, through my career, you know, and in the last few years, uh, well, I would say the last few years, but. You know, through the 90s and the uh, early 2000s, uh, everybody hated Microsoft. They're all of, you know, all the open source. They all hated Microsoft. They like, and not even giving it a chance. Not, you know, not understanding what the tools have in it. Um, and it always bothered me because, you know, I kind of, you know, I did a lot of Power Builder. I did a, did a lot of C programming. And in the early 2000s, I got into .NET and just loved the tool set and have been a bit of an evangelist ever since for it. So. Um, I, I love the fact that, you know, I love Palmer, he was great, it was, it was all good, those were good times, and were good years, but now uh, Satya has really changed the look and feel of Microsoft completely, and, you know, and in his words he says, you know, ju judge us by the actions you've seen recently and in the future, not by the past, don't assume this is the old Microsoft anymore, and if we look over a little bit of a timeline, of what's been going on at Microsoft, and we go back as far as 2012, you know, things like Git added to TFS, you know, it was a big deal when they added Git in. You know, a lot of us are going, what the heck did they do that for? What's Git? Um, you know, TypeScript, TypeScript was released. In 2014, um, Satya made the proclamation that Microsoft loves Linux, and we'll talk more about Linux in a second. Um, Microsoft Org got them, um, on GitHub was created. Um, .NET Foundation was created. Um, 2015, VS Code was released. Um, 2016, .NET Core 1.0. I'll just pick some of the, the highlight ones. Um, Microsoft joins the Linux Foundation. At one point, and I think still today, Microsoft is the largest contributor to Linux from an open source point of view. Um, <clears throat> GitHub recognizes Microsoft as a top open source contributor to the point where a couple of years later they <laughs> well, you know that story, right? Um, Microsoft uh, Azure Kubernetes service launched. Um, SQL 2017 on Linux, that was a huge deal, right? That's a big deal. The Windows source code moved to Git. That was a massive deal. I don't know if you guys know that whole story, but when um, 
when Microsoft, you know, uh, was was adding Git to TFS and and falling in love with Git and understanding that you know a lot of the world used Git and we should be on board with this and there's good reasons why they do and everything and then they tried to start using it internally and they realized Git couldn't hack it. It couldn't take really large repositories. It wasn't made for that. It wasn't made for uh, a repository that's gigs in size like this, like the Windows source code. Uh, so they did a lot of work with Git to make it so that it could do that. And once once they could do that, then they were like, okay, if the largest piece of software in the world can fit into Git, then we're good. Everybody can use it. We'll talk more about all the stuff Microsoft does with, with those kinds of things. Um, and then 2018, uh, Visual Studio Code was ranked the number one developer tool. Um, uh, 5,000 Microsoft employees committing to open source projects on GitHub. Like, like GitHub is just, you know, it was big before. It's just completely exploded to Microsoft's in there. Um, Azure trending to 50% Linux. That's actually not true. Uh, more than 50% of the VMs on Azure are Linux now. More than half. So you know, as you can see, this you know this is a plan that he had that he's that he's taken Microsoft on this bit of a journey uh, up to 2018. And you know, uh, if you're at all involved in the Microsoft world, you've seen this happening. And and to a lot of Microsoft people, it's probably a little bit scary. It's like you know, where's my .NET? Where's my you know, what's this core? What's all you know? What's all this other stuff? Do I really have to learn Linux? Is somebody going to make me use VI? Like, what's going on here? I don't I don't want any of that. Um, but it's a good move for Microsoft, right? It is, it, it's, it's really a good move for Microsoft. Um, so, you know, correlating in this, you know, and then, you know, we've got the cloud and we got everything else is going on in our industry now. Uh, and Microsoft has this uh, amazing tool called, um, well, last called VSTS, right? So how many people in the room use either TFS or VSTS as your DevOps? Okay, good. Um, so this is good. I'm glad it wasn't tons because it's a bit of an introduction for some people. Um, so TFS was a product that came out in 2005, believe it or not, um, and it was uh, called Team Foundation, Team Foundation Systems, and it is essentially uh, was a product that gave us version control, right? It was kind of the, the predecessor after VSS, because Microsoft bought SourceSafe, a terrible move, but but they got good people with it, so it was okay. Uh, and they brought Brian Harry along, who was the guy that wrote SourceSafe. And I've never had this happen before. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay, come on in. <laughs> Everyone, my special guest. <laughs> um, so Team Foundation Server, you know, based on SourceSafe, but they thought, okay, you know, a sort a version control tool has to have more than that. We also have to include um, you know, some kind of way to track requirements and, and that kind of stuff. So that's what TFS did. Very poorly at the time, but it was version one, you know, let's give it a break. Uh, it wasn't great or anything, but it was but it was cool, it was good. 2008 came along and it was, you know, it was a, a little bit better. They added automated builds to it. Um, so Team City had something to worry about, right? We didn't have to use all that stuff. Um, we could actually do our builds. We still build scripts, so that was icky, but then 2010 came along and that was sort of, that was a big moment. It was huge, right? We had testing tools. Um, the builds with the XAML, which sounds really crappy right now, but it was really good at the time. It was better than what they had before. Um, and uh, and they called it, and it was, I think around then it was called VS, no, in 2008 it was VSTS again, Visual Studio Team Systems. Then in 2012, they got, they moved into the web interface. And then, and at, throughout this time, they're starting to get more and more agile as well. So now, 2012 comes out, and we've all of a sudden got, we're getting an update three or four months later, and then another one, and another one, and another one, and then 2013. Well, we were seeing this product every three years we were seeing an update. And now all of a sudden, every few months we're getting an update, it's like, oh man, this thing's moving really fast and really, really good. Um, so now it's called VSO, uh, and it's in the cloud. We've got a cloud version called Visual Studio Online. Uh, and then they renamed that to VSTS again, we won't talk about that, it was a terrible idea. Um, and uh, it's growing in popularity, and the cloud version is great, and they're very agile teams, and they are putting out releases in that cloud version every three to six weeks. You're getting new updates to the point where some sometimes you're annoyed because you come in Monday morning and you 
sign into um, with them was DSDS, and the UI has changed on you, and you're like, where the heck did this go? And you gotta go find it again. Um, so they've kind of slowed that down a bit, uh, except for what, <laughs> what we're gonna do to you today, I'll show you. And now, and then they decided, we're gonna rebrand this. We're going down the wrong road. So <clears throat> the road they were going down was fantastic. They had, you know, you could build Java apps, you could build iOS apps, you could build Android apps, you could deploy to AWS or Google or to um, Azure. You could, uh, you can just do anything on any platform. You can build on Linux. You can build on Mac. All of this stuff was built right into this tool called Visual Studio Team Services. So the problem with that was a lot of customers are out there and they're looking at it going, well, it's got Visual Studio in the name, so it must be all .NET stuff. And I do Java, so I can't use that. That's no good to me. Uh, not realizing, just you know, from a lack of knowledge, that they could be using Visual Studio Team Systems to build anything they want. I've, I, and I've told you guys this at other groups, but I do a lot of work with the pipelines and uh, Azure DevOps, and I've built. I've never found a technology I couldn't build and release yet. I have not come across one yet, and you know, all kinds of stuff from Duck Creek, uh, GMC, Java, .NET, um, Dynamics, Power Builder, Delphi. I can just go on and on. It's just anything. If I can do it at a command line, I can do it in here. Simple as that. Um, so. I think I went off on a little tangent about being able to build everything and I forgot my train of thought. So, um, uh, so what they've done now with Azure, that way, yeah, they, they, they decide they need to rebrand. They can't have Visual Studio in the name. It's just too .NET. It's just people just think of .NET when they think of Visual Studio. Uh, and rightly so, because they did a really good job of branding that. Right? They just did too good a job for that. So they said, we've got to rename it. And I can remember I was at the MVP conference that they were telling us options, and some of them were just horrible. They were just terrible. Can't even, wouldn't even dare mention them. Um, but they kind of came up with this idea of Azure DevOps. And at first people were kind of, you know, we were sort of thinking Azure, do we really want to name it after Azure? But because Azure is kind of, it's just an open cloud environment where I can have Linux machines and Windows machines together and, and I can do any kind of technology. I can uh, build and deploy my uh, Android apps and do tests on them and, and I can have Mac machines, I can do all that it's a lot more open feeling for people. So, so let's call it Azure DevOps, um, because it is DevOps, right? It's, you know, it's about, um, it's about agile and pipelines and, and um, uh, repositories like Nougat and NPM and Maven um, for artifacts, and, and it's my source control. It's everything I need to be a DevOps team. So Azure DevOps, makes sense. The other thing was, the, ben the, the nice part about, um, Azure DevOps or TFS uh, was always the fact that it was integrated, right? So I could, you know, I could, I could grab uh, GitHub and I could get uh, Octopus and Team City and I could get Trello and QTP. <laughs> I couldn't do that, but I mean, get, there's other test tools um, and you know, Artifactory or whatever. There's lots of tools out there that do all these things, and they're great. They're good tools. They're fantastic. I've used them on many projects. They work great, but they all have to be bolted together, right? They're all independent of each other. And the nice thing about this was it's one repository for all of this. So I can have, you know, when I do when I do a build, I know that that my source has been tagged or labeled with that build number, and I know what release uh, used that build to deploy to which environment. And these things are just completely traceable right across the whole environment, across all the products. So that was a good thing about them being integrated. But still, people go, well, you know, that's all good. And I love your, I love your agile boards, or I love, I love the, the backlogs and the sprints. That stuff's really good. But we use Team City. We're always going to use Team City. We're just, you know, that's the way it is. Uh, or, you know, we're GitHub people. We're going to use GitHub. So why would I bother getting all this when I'm, you know, I'm stuck with your Git? I'm going to use GitHub anyway, so I'm like I'm buying something I don't need. Um, so in Azure DevOps, the big thing is these are all split apart now. They're all completely integrated, but you can get them split. You can say, I got a project that only uses Azure repos and pipelines. 
I got a project that uses GitHub and pipelines and Azure Borgs, and I got another project that uses um, uh, TFDC and pipelines and Trello. So I can mix them out, and I'll show you how you can go into your project and you can turn off, uh, turn them on and off so that you can see what, you can only use the ones that you want. So they divided the product up into five sections, Azure Boards, Azure Pipelines, Azure Repos, Azure Test Plans, and Azure Artifacts. I'm gonna do really quick what those, what those are, and then I'm gonna, I'll take a sit and do a bit of a demo. Um, so Azure Boards is probably what you think it is. Azure Boards is all the backlogs and sprints, uh, and all that kind of stuff. All the stuff around, um, the, uh, the web interface and BSTS uh, that gave us the ability to set up teams and, and um, do our work tracking. It's got the Kanban boards, the task boards, and all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the all the same functionality that you might be used to from TFS or, um, or BSTS, um, plus a whole lot more. There's a lot of really nice user interface, uh, uh, nice advances in the user interface to make it a lot easier to get around. Um, and a lot of new features, and new features coming fast and furious, but very, very quickly. Um, one thing I'll just point out about this, um, there's another section that they all get, and that's kind of the reporting the dashboards. And for those of you that have used Team Foundation Server, and you have uh, uh, reporting services for reporting, because what happened to the TFS, it came with a report server and a warehouse and a cube and it would, every couple hours, it would dump data from your collection into this warehouse so that you could do reports on it. And there, it came with a handful of reporting services reports that you could run, and it was all integrated very nicely, and it worked very well. And you could also build drone reports off the cube or off the warehouse if you wanted to, and a lot of people did, and that's great. When they moved to the cloud, they kind of abandoned the reports. So if you, if you went to VSTS in the cloud, you didn't have, really have any of that reporting at all. Uh, and that is coming back. Microsoft has, it was like, it was just low on the backlog, that's all. There were more important things to do at the beginning. Uh, they've got a lot of those done, and now they are working on that. So, um, so Azure Boards, you'll also see um, a lot of stuff around a thing called uh, analytics. So there's an analytics extension that you can add from the marketplace into Azure Boards, and you can, um, that will allow, what that does is it takes data out of your collection and puts it into data sets that you can run, use Power BI to generate reports. Very, very slick. I don't think we'll have a lot of time to show you much of that tonight, but uh, we can do it every time. Uh, Azure Repos is our source repository. Now this can be Team Foundation version control still, uh, or it can be Git. And this is Git. This isn't Microsoft's Git. This is Git. This is the open source Git. And I just hooked to it, right? So they built interface on top of it. Uh, it keeps getting better and better all the time. At the beginning, it wasn't great, um, but it is, it, you know, from within Visual Studio and, and uh, Visual Studio Code and tools like that, but it is much, much better. Uh, it's, it's actually first class now. Um, but if you, don't, if you don't want to use that, you can use, if you've got your own Git tools that you want to use because you're used to using you know, GitHub or some other <coughs> tool, some other Git repository, you can use those as well. Um, I'm not familiar with a lot of them, but I know there's a, an SVC tortoise-like one. There's, there's a whole bunch of them out there. So if you're used to using your own, go for it. You can do that. Um, TFEC is still around. Um, it's not going to go anywhere because there are thousands and thousands of customers out there that are still on TFEC, and Microsoft will not abandon them. Um, you're not going to see a, probably not going to see tons of love for TFEC from a feature point of view. Um, there's a lot of great love going into Git from a feature point of view, uh, but both both still good, good, completely usable um, source repositories. And the big difference for those that aren't familiar, uh, TFEC is a server base. So you know if you're always connected to the server, it's going to do you just fine, right? You're you're just connected to it. You're checking in and out. Uh, the whole repository is up on the server. With Git, it's distributed, so you actually clone the repository, and you have a repository on your local machine, and you can check in and out of it all you want, and then at some point, you can push those changes all up into the main repository, or into a branch of it. So it, it is built for um, for doing distributed development, right? It comes out of the Linux world, where people would, you know, they're working on the Linux code base, and they can pull, Linux, pull the whole code base down, and they can work away on it locally, and do whatever they want for months at a time, or whatever, and then go, okay, here's some changes. 
and make a po uh, do a pull request and say, here, pull this all up into the main repository. And there's a lot of great tools around that, doing those pull requests and, and having policies on them so that somebody can validate the code and make sure that it's good and that all your tests are working and so you can't, you know, you can't do it without all those, those checks. Um, Azure Test Plan, so anybody who's used um, Test Manager or, or the Test Hub uh, in VSTS will be familiar with Test Plans. Um, uh, this guy is uh, an extra charge, so essentially when you're, when you're, I'll talk about pricing towards the end just so you have an idea what it costs to use, to use the tools, because there's some very interesting uh, free options. Um, but Azure Test Plans, if you're gonna build Test Plans, um, in, in the tool, I think it, I think it's, I'm probably gonna say it wrong, so 12 bucks a month? It's not a lot, but essentially it's a lot cheaper than it used to be to have a test uh, MSDN subscription. As your pipelines, uh, here's where the really good stuff is. So this is build and release, right? These, and I'll, I'll show you guys what it looks like now uh, and what's coming up in it. Um, <clears throat> some of the super exciting things about this is not just the power that it has and what it can do and the, and the great UI that they put around it, but you can, you can build and release any technology on any platform. So, and it's all just built into it. It's all just point and click and drag. And if, if you don't want to use that user interface that I'm, I'll show you, um, you can build it in YAML if you want. So you can build it as a, as a YAML script and store it in source control and then just pull it out and it will read your YAML script to do the build or do the release or spin up an environment and deploy to it, and all that stuff can be done in YAML as well. Oh, I'm giving you a sneak peek, Zed. Um, so super extensible, there is a marketplace full of extensions. Um, you know, and a majority of those are around Azure Pipelines. They're tasks that let you do things like, like um, build CRM applications or, or um, SonarCube or you know, whatever, there's all, just tons and tons of there are hundreds of them out there. Um, super, I was so super excited about how much people were contributing to this. Uh, it, it's really good. Um, containers and Kubernetes, all that built in, so if anybody wants to deploy to a container, um, that kind of stuff is just made so easy for you now. Uh, you, you, almost, you almost don't have to learn it, right? You can just kind of pick and choose the stuff you want and say, okay, there you go, build me a container and put it in this repository. And then deploy it over here to this machine. Wonderful. Um, so here, yeah. So Azure Pipeline. So here's one of the one of the really cool things that I haven't even talked about yet. I wanted to wait for this slide to do it. So they took Azure uh, DevOps, and it's not just. Uh, so it's it's a. So f let me let me create. There's a couple of things going through my head. I want to make sure I tell, I'll tell you about. So one one thing about it is, there nothing competes with this. So there is. Not another product that is cloud hosted that can handle the, that can scale to any enterprise. I'll show you some numbers that Microsoft uses on this, but you know, you can't do this with last, at last scene. You can't, you, there's just, there's, you know, if there's small projects, fine, but they just can't scale up to be able to, to do this, this kind of stuff. Um, and, one of the things uh, that Microsoft wanted to be able to do, now we all know that they purchased GitHub, and GitHub is part of the, uh, that world now, so that's great. But that, you know, they didn't say, okay, well we're gonna take, uh, we're gonna buy GitHub and that's gonna be our open source platform where people can do open source projects. They made Azure DevOps an open source tool. So if you go into Azure DevOps, I'll, I'll show you, remind me to show you how to, where it is. When you create a new project in your Azure DevOps organization, you can choose whether it's public or private. If it's private, it's yours, just like it always was. When you need your credentials to get into it, you, need, you can add users to it and they'll get an invitation and they can join and work with you on it. But if you, you can make it public and it is open to the world. Anybody can see that project. You have full use of Azure Pipelines, um, the repo, Azure Repo, um, Azure Boards, all the tools that are there are available to you. Um, if you have a public project, you get free unlimited build minutes for your public projects. So if you set up an open source project in Azure DevOps, you get automated build and release for free. It is part of the deal. 
So GitHub, nobody else does that. You can now hook up Azure pipelines to GitHub, but I'll talk about that later, that's a whole different thing. Um, and you get up to 10 free parallel jobs across Windows, Linux, and Mac. So imagine I got an open source project, and, I'm, and we're building a, an, a, an app that is gonna be uh, mobile, right? I need it to be, I need to do iOS, I need to do Android, I don't know, whatever, what, I'm doing some. And you know, to support the open source world, I have not only a, a public repository that I can invite other developers to contribute to this, but we have access to automated builds and automated pipelines and all of that in the cloud. I don't have to have any infrastructure to do it, to set it up, it's all set up for me. Sweet. Any open source developers in the room? Anybody do any open source? So you're way less excited about this than... I mean, you're talking to a room full of open source people, they go, what? It's free? Um, integrated with Git, so Azure Pipelines is now available uh, to any uh, developer from the GitHub Marketplace. So if you go into GitHub, you can actually hook Azure Pipelines up to your, to your GitHub project. It's amazing. Uh, Azure Artifacts. So Azure Artifacts is, um, that piece is essentially uh, an artifact repository. It's like NuGet or NPM or Maven, right? So you can, um, you can, you can build a common DLL and push it into your own NuGet server, and then everybody can consume that from there. I've done that with many customers, and people love the fact that they don't have to put it up in nougat.org because it's theirs. It's not meant to share for everybody in the world. It's just, it's just something that their developers share amongst themselves, and they feel they have uh, control. They don't have to set up their own nougat server. It's built right into Azure DevOps for them. So let's have a little look around a bit. Um, you know, this might be what you're used to seeing. This is um, this is the new um, Azure DevOps, but this isn't actually the new UI. This is the old UI, and this one, you know, we've got our uh, stuff across the top, right? If I just pop into work here, you see I've got my dashboards, my code, my work, my pipelines, testing, the wiki, some analytics views, and then I got a sub menu under that, and all all the the stuff that we kind of got used to in the web interface, but. So if you're using Azure DevOps, what I want you to do is this. I want you to click on, and if you haven't already done it, whoop, I want you to go click on yourself and go to preview features. And I want you to turn on the new navigation. And you know, notice I've got some other stuff turned on here too, uh, the new release hub and the new build hub. So we'll see some of that uh, as I do some stuff with you tonight. So this is the new navigation, the new UI. Um, much easier, uh, you know, it, like anything, when you're used to a certain UI, you, it takes you a few minutes to kind of acclimate yourself to it, but once you do, it just flows really nicely. So um, so I'm in a, let's actually jump out of here for a minute. So you see, there's, these are all my organizations. So these are all um, uh, Azure DevOps accounts that I'm uh, connected with. So I can, I can jump between them or go into any one of those. Uh, I can, I, down here to my Azure uh, organization settings down at the bottom and I can, that's how I can kind of control my account and, and do my setups and things and create projects. And when I create a project, you'll see right here, uh, I can create a private or a public project. So that's how you can set up an open source um, uh, account or a project within, within your organization. And then you can decide whether you want to do Team Foundation, Version Control, or Git. And just as a, a lot of people don't know this, I'll just kind of throw it out there. If you're not sure, uh, you know, if you're developers or you are very used to Team Foundation, Version Control, or ThorSafe, that kind of tool, and you know, the, you're a little bit worried about the learning curve to Git, but you still would like to try it out in that, if you create a TFBC project, you can add Git repos to it. You can have both in the same repo if you want to. Um, so each of these, you know, different projects. So let's just jump into a project really quickly. Uh, and then when I'm from within this project, um, on the overview, you can see down here, this is where I can turn on and off services. So I've turned off artifacts because I'm not using them. And in fact, we, we won't do anything with test plans tonight. I'll turn them off really quickly in here too. So now by turning these things off, when I... Um, when I go over, see my test plans just disappeared from the side. 
So I can simplify the user interface a bit. I can just say, let's turn these off and let's, uh, let's just worry about the things that we, um, that we want to use and not worry about the extra stuff hanging around. You couldn't do that in the old UI, so you always had everything across the top regardless. Um, so here's Azure Boards. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you Azure Boards and Azure Pipelines. That probably will kill enough of a night, so um, we don't have hours and hours here, I assume. Right? You guys go to about 11? Is that so far you told me? No. Do we want a break tonight? We can have a break if people want. I don't. I never want a break. I'm happy to just talk. But if everybody wants a break, we can take. You tell me if you if we need a break. Okay. Okay. Everybody can grab a T-shirt. Um, so Azure boards. So here's my Azure boards, right? Um, so essentially, I've got. Um, Backlog, so I've got multiple teams here. Uh, this isn't nearly as confusing as, as it looks. Here's all the backlogs right here. These are just sort of team ones and favorites and where I was last time, uh, a cache. Uh, but I've got a couple of teams. I've got a team in London and a team in Toronto, and then I've got an external vendor. Um, and if I just go into my Toronto backlog, you can see here's my backlog. I can flip between whether I want to see a backlog of FX features or backlog items. So I'll just look at my backlog items. I've set up the project to include bugs to be uh, treated as a requirement, so they show up in my backlog instead of on my task board. Um, but any, how many Agile teams in the room? How many people are doing Agile or Scrum or well, not too many? So, um, so this is my backlog of work, right? This is the work assigned to this to this particular team. Uh, if I go over here, I've got they kind of tried to. Uh, it used to be a lot of stuff across the top of the bar here, and it kept growing as they added features and getting more and more. Um, so they kind of tried to to simplify it. So you know, right here, all I've got is my create a new work item. If I want to create a new back, a new backlog item from here, I can do it just by clicking that. If I want to switch between my Kanban board and my backlog, then there's that guy right there. It just lets me switch really easily between them. Um, over here is just a, a bunch of view options, so I can turn parents on, so if I'm in the backlog looking at backlog items and I turn parents on, it'll show me the features and then the epics. Um, forecasting lets me forecast out how many sprints out it's going to take to get all this work done, assuming I know the velocity of my team and I've got some story points assigned to these stories. Um, really nice feature is this planning. So if I turn on planning, see what it does? It Over the side it shows me all the sprints that I've laid out already in the system. So I've gone as a product owner or scrum master or one of the team members or maybe just as the team we do it together, but we've we've laid out up to four sprints ahead. Uh, you can see this is sprint one is my current sprint. It tells me that right there, uh, and I can just take items and and just drag them over here and drop them on a sprint and say, oh, I'm going to do this in sprint two. So you can do your sprint planning really easily. Just pull off the backlog, drag it into a sprint. Nice and simple. Um, if you if somebody was adding new work items and you wanted, but they didn't make a, a child of anything, then I can turn on mapping, and it will essentially the mapping will show me whatever level I'm on the one above. So I'm in backlog items, and it's going to show me my uh, features. So if I flip to features, it will show me any epics that I would have had over here. So. The idea is if I've got something that somebody added but they never added it to a feature and I want to include it so I can do a little bit of management of, of work, then I can just grab stuff and drag it over and drop it on it and it'll change the child, it'll change the parent to be that feature name. They've put in some other great things they've done to the UI that, and, and I point these out, they seem simple but, but these are very well thought out. Um, features that came from us. You know, people complaining and saying, you know, I can't, there's a filter on a bunch of places, but it's not consistent. It looks different everywhere I go. So they built in this one feature, um, you know, and I can, I can just go duration and it'll show me all the ones with the word duration in the title or in the, in the uh, description. Or I can look at just the bugs if I want. And this filter is the exact same filter whether I'm on the backlog, the sprint backlog, or the Kanban board. So it's consistent across everything. 
So, and the boards, the boards haven't really changed a lot. It's the same great Kanban board. It lets me do things like, uh, you'll see I've changed uh, committed into uh, dev and QA, and I've split dev into doing and done, and all that is done through these customizations. I can add more, new columns. I can add swim lanes. Um, I've got it set up to show all the priority ones uh, as red, so I can get visual cues of different things. I think anybody, has anybody used the Kanban boards in here? See, I keep thinking I've talked here before and I'm worried now that yeah. <laughs> I don't want to bore you with stuff that I've showed you before, so I'm kind of going high level, but I'm worried that you guys haven't seen this and would like to maybe see more. So please feel free to ask me questions. If this, if this is new and anybody wants to see something uh, a little deeper than where I'm going, I'm happy to do it. So um, please say so. Um, so, you know, there's my boards, my backlogs, and then of course I've got sprints. Um, you know, on the sprints, they kind of brought it all together. For those of you who used it before, it was always very confusing because there was, um, you know, down the side there was the, uh, you could pick either epics or features or backlog items, and then below that there was past and current and future sprints, and depending on what you were on, there was a thing in the middle called boards. And de depending on your context, sometimes it took you to a task board and sometimes it took you to a Kanban board. And it was all kind of confusing. So now everything to do with sprints is under this little tab right here, under sprints. So as long as you pop into there, you're going to have everything to do with sprints. So there's my task board. These are all the things that, I've, um, that we're going to do in this sprint. And when I say we're going to do, I'm talking about the Toronto team. So you can see right up here, there, that's the team I'm on. If I want to switch teams, I can just pull that down and switch over to the London team. And now I get the full context of the London team. Nice, eh? First person to say that's nice gets a t-shirt. <laughs> um, so the task board, then I've got my backlog. So here's my sprint backlog. These are all the things that we're going to do during the sprint. And I got, of course, my capacity planner. So I can take my, uh, the members of my team and uh, put in a, the, the amount of capacity per day that they can work on the tasks that are in the sprint. And that gives me the ability to see my work details. So it lets me know whether we're going to... So it looks like Dan and I are both actually way over capacity in the sprint. In other words, there's not enough hours left in this sprint than there are tasks assigned to us. And the tasks assigned to us are, you know, you can just go to the task board and see. There's all kinds of stuff assigned to us here. And we either have not been updating this or... That's so nice. It's beautiful. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I almost forgot I promised that. Now it feels kind of fake, though, i got to admit. Um, I can flip between sprints. So, I, like I said, I've set up up to four sprints ahead. So I can, I can flip between sprints and kind of look at a future sprint or a past sprint quite easily. Uh, I still have things like my queries. So I can go in and, and create um, work item queries and you know, generate charts and that for my dashboards off of those. So that's all still there. Uh, we also though, get this work items tab. And this is kind of a nice tab. I'm just kind of getting used to it. Um, but it's got some really cool features. Uh, there's a recycle bin now for those of you that are on our older versions of TFS when there wasn't a recycle bin. So now you can delete a work item and it just goes to the recycle bin. You can pull it back out. Um, but I've got a, several views here under my work items. So I can see assigned to me. So these are all the things assigned to me. <coughs> Uh, I can see anything that I'm following, anything that I'm mentioned in. And just to be clear on that, for those of you that are new to this, if I go into a story, see this little button right here? It says follow. So if I want to follow something, I just click that. And now I'll get emails every time somebody makes a change to this work item. And when I'm done following it, I don't care about it anymore, I just turn that off. That's awesome. Thanks. <laughs> Media large? Media? Extra large. Extra large? Yes. I don't know what I'm throwing, so you'll have to. I have a, um, I have a question about recycle bin. The, yeah, the recycle bin? Yeah. So if you delete recycle, that's it, yeah? It's gone, yeah. So you delete a work item, it'll go to the recycle bin, and then in the recycle bin you can, you can permanently delete from there. Because it happened to me to delete the recycle and then thinking that I need it back. Oh, don't. don't in the that. operating <laughs> system. Don't do that. <laughs> You're not going to get it back after that. It's, it's pretty, they've done a really good job on... It makes me laugh when you go to delete something. Like if you go to delete a, 
uh, you know, an area or um, a build or a release, uh, it'll actually make you type the name of it into a text box before it'll let you delete it. So you can go delete and it'll open a dialog and go, are you sure you want to delete this? Type its whole name here and you're going to type it exactly as it is before the delete button will come on. So they're protecting us from ourselves very nicely. Um, I mentioned that there's another uh, query there, uh, not only what I'm following, but what I mentioned in. So mentions are cool enough to, you got to see what a mention does. So um, when you go to the discussion field, so a discussion field is where you talk about the work item. So if I wanted to tell the tester it works on my machine, then I can type that right into the discussion and they'll get, it'll become part of the history of the work item. But if I put an at in, you'll see it just comes up with a list of everybody. So I can send Nick a note that says, uh, Nick, this works on my machine. I gotta be careful when I dev, Nick's a real person. And sometimes I demo this and I forget and they get an email and then they call <laughs> me and give me, were you demoing last night? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so I can, if I save this, Nick will get an email that says, hey, you were mentioned in, you know, uh, backlog item 1893 and the message was this works on my machine. And he has a link back to this, it'll bring him right to the work item. And then, just jump out of here. I don't want to save you. I want to go back. Um, so you can see there's all the things that I'm following. And this kind of gives me a way to also like unfollow stuff, right? I can, oh, I forgot I've been following that for ages and I don't care about that anymore. You can turn the following off. Or you can look for stuff that you've been mentioned in. So this would be anything that I've been mentioned in. I think it kind of goes the last 30 days or so. It's not everything you've ever been mentioned in. It's, it's recently mentioned in. Um, so, but really, really nice view. So, um, and then you just got your activity. So things that I've recently made changes to. So here's sort of the stuff that I've been working with lately. So they've really gone very serious into making it mo so much more useful for every day and making our lives um, a whole bunch easier. Um, a couple other, I gotta show, I gotta show you this because this is a cool thing. Um, there's a search, there's a code search feature now. So watch, if I'm in the repo, see what I can do here? I can search for a class through my code. So I can go, that's nice. yeah, isn't that, isn't that sweet? So I can go, again, I got a t-shirt. You said that's nice? Um, so I can go, I don't know what classes I have in here, I'll be honest with you, uh, product something. Um, and it'll go off and search my repository for, um, for code where there's a class, hey, I found one, <laughs> where there's a class called product. Sweet, eh? So that stuff is in, and I'm going to show you this because uh, this will take us to a break time maybe. Um, that, is, that is built as an extension to Azure DevOps. And if you go, if you look right over here, see this little shopping bag? So this is where you can browse the marketplace. And if we go over to browse the marketplace, here are things that we can add in to enhance what Azure DevOps does. And this is honestly absolutely chock full of fantastic tools. Um, some of my favorites are uh, Code Search is one. Um, plans, I'll, I'll show you guys plans really quick in a minute. Um, the analytics is another good one that you want to add. Um, analytics gives you um, those data sets from your collection so that you can report on them. Uh, it's super powerful. You can create those and then you can connect Power BI to them, pull the data down and run all kinds of reports, do whatever you want. But that data that comes down is so beautifully normalized. It's just like, it's like when you try to do this stuff with a work item query, it gets difficult because a work item query lets me get a bunch of work items and I can build a work item query to show me my parents and children and stuff, but it's very difficult to get, like it's always another row, right? So I can get my, my, my user story, but his parent isn't actually part of the same row that I'm, you know, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's a hierarchy, it's not. So when you pull from the analytics data um, and you pull in a work item, one of the columns in the row is who's my parent? So you can really easily get to just tons of really good stuff in there. Um, but look, there's tools for ReSharper. Um, there's code analysis. Um, you know, above and beyond the code analysis that comes with Visual Studio. There's, uh, you know, if you're doing um, 
Microsoft Dynamics stuff, there's tools for Dynamics. So these might be things that aren't built into Azure DevOps that somebody has added, uh, created um, a tool, an extension that we can add in. <clears throat> They're, it's kind of a self-governing world, right? We rate these, uh, you can see the ratings on them. So that folder management one is by Microsoft Dev Labs and it's got four stars, so it's probably good to go. Um, if it says Microsoft, so see right here, test and feedback, code search, they're Microsoft. That means they are Microsoft published tools. <coughs> if it says Microsoft Dev Labs, it means it's, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is my understanding of it, is that they're Microsoft employees that are kind of externally on their own time writing tools for extensions. So it's kind of a, um, it's not, you know, it's not a supported by Microsoft, but it is Microsoft. Um, and then, you know, other stuff, other vendors, SonarCube, you know, has written one for SonarCube. Um, uh, and then there's individuals, there's just people. You'll see ones like, you know, Bob's Tools and Bill's Tools and Betty's Tools. And some of them are absolutely fantastic. And you just check, just check the rating and, you know, read about it. Uh, pretty much the source for most of the uh, open source, well, like the ones that people are adding, uh, are all in GitHub. So you can usually just kind of like, um, you can usually jump into the, to the tool itself, it'll tell you about it. Um, and quite often, here's your, you can go to support, and this will likely take me to GitHub. Nope, this took me to a blog. That's a different. The one I picked that doesn't take me to GitHub. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> anyway, so quite often that will take you to GitHub and where they'll have issues for it. And the code will be there, and if you want to contribute to it, go for it. It's really good. What's that AWS for Windows? You have it there. Yeah, for AWS. So being able to go to uh, Amazon Cloud. That's what the, you mean, so you, you see one in here? Is that what you're? Yeah. There was one in there. So from a Windows platform, you access the, uh, the I Amazon? Know. I don't know. We'd oh, okay. To, we'd have to look at it. I don't, there are hundreds in here. <laughs> I cannot pretend. Uh, to just out them. of curiosity. There are tasks. No, these are, ta these are build tasks for deploying to Amazon Cloud is what it looks like. So see there, if you look, the categories, there's different, you know, the categories essentially are, you know, there's, arti there's tools for Azure artifacts, there's tools for Azure boards, for pipelines, for repos, and for test pipelines. So you'll notice the pipelines is the most, right? 596 different tools for Azure pipelines. And those are essentially going, when we look at Azure pipelines after break, you'll see there's tasks that you can pull in. And we can actually get to the marketplace right from within a build. I'll show you how to do that. Um, but those are, those are tasks that allow me to do things during a build or during a release. Whereas the Azure Boards ones are usually more uh, kind of reporting things like that work out in Visualizer. Um, I think I have him installed. Let me see if I can find him. Just to give you an example of the kinds of things that, that they do. So if I go into a work item, see if I can pick one that isn't terrible. So see this visualize menu item that got added to the bottom of the menu there? So if I, if I just say visualize, <coughs> so it, it just gives me, so somebody wrote a thing, they said, oh, I want to be able to visualize my, my work item relationships. So here I, I've got, let's see if we can get this to be, so I've got a, um, I've got a user story, and then I've got, it's got a whole bunch of children. It's also got a parent, which is a feature, and it's got, it's tested by this test case. So there's all the relationships to this guy, but it also gives me fun things. If I click on that, you'll see it'll expand it out, and it'll show me that it's got um, a parent, which is an epic, and a child, which is a story. And now I can dive into that child and see all of, whoa, getting a little smaller, and see all of its children. It's just somebody wrote a tool and put it in the marketplace and you can add it, add it in, it's free. You can add it into your Azure DevOps account and play with it, try it out. Um, you know, here's, here's one. Uh, so this is actually an extension. So if I have multiple teams <coughs> and I'm trying to track when I'm going to get something and I've got multiple teams and I've got epics that have multiple features and those features are across multiple releases and then all the stories underneath those features are spread across a bunch of teams. I can open up uh, a plan and see if I customize, I can customize it to say, 
I would include my Toronto team and my London team, and I want to show backlog items. And so when I do that, it'll show me, there's my Toronto team in Sprint 1, they're fixing a bug and doing two stories, and the London team is doing two stories. And in Sprint 2, they got three, and I can expand these and see what they are. I can look at this at a feature level if I want. So as long as you put what feature the, or what Sprint the feature is going to be done in, then somebody else can come along and do some high level planning and actually see where things are going to be released. You can put in milestones, you'll see here I, I put in Christmas Day and New Year's Day just as milestones so we kind of know when those are. Um, another cool extension is the calendar. <clears throat> so this is a team's uh, calendar view. So right here, we there's Sprint 1, you can, I don't know if it shows up for you guys. Does that show up a little darker there? Yeah. Yeah, from the 19th to the 30th? You say yeah, are you already gonna show? I already did. Oh, okay, I don't wanna. Um, but in here, you can, you, know, you can see if there's days off for people, they'll show up in here. You can add events, so if you have a, you know, if, if the Friday end of every sprint is um, a review with the stakeholders, then um, you can put that in there. And it shows up in your calendar, so you can add stuff to the calendar very easily. And it's essentially, once again, it's a team's calendar. So if I go to the Toronto team and look at their calendar, you see Dan had a day off on the 16th. And if I flip to London, they might have, there we go, there's some stuff. So look, so there's sprint planning for sprint one, sprint two. There's our review. We got some grooming sessions in here. I've got a day off for the 7th, Dan had a day off for the 23rd. So just, you know, for, for a, a team, how nice is it to have kind of team related stuff in a calendar right in? And this is just a Microsoft DevOps extension. It's free. Plug it in and away you go. Lori's smiling. You've never seen that? No. You always learn something, don't you? I know. <laughs> okay, you want to take five? Yeah. Okay, let's take five and then we'll talk about um, the pipeline. Come and grab a t-shirt, guys.